Thank you again, guys, for being with us tonight. It's been a really special year of Agape Latte, and no better close to the year than Matt and Sarah. So Matt and Sarah Hasbeck met at the Heights back in 1997, where they were both standout athletes. Sarah was an All-American goalkeeper for BC Field Hockey and the winner of the Eagle of the, Eagle of the Year Award for Outstanding Female Athlete. She was selected to play for the junior national team and was an alternate for the U.S. national team, and we learned tonight from trivia that she was inducted into the BC Athletics Hall of Fame back in 2002. Matt Hasbeck is a former NFL quarterback and current analyst for ESPN's Sunday NFL Countdown. He was raised not far from BC in Norfolk, Massachusetts, attended Severian Brothers High School in Westwood, and went on to play quarterback at Boston College. Drafted by the Green Bay Packers in 1998, Matt later led the Seattle Seahawks to six playoff runs and a Super Bowl appearance in 2005. He later played for the Tennessee Titans and Indianapolis Colts, was selected to three Pro Bowls in his career, and holds a number of Seattle Seahawks franchise records. Most importantly, and they wanted us to stress this, Matt and, Matt and Sarah are proud parents of Annabelle, Mallory, and Henry, and recently returned to the Boston area where they can spend time with their family and enjoy their intense love for New England hockey. So without further ado, thank you so much for being with here to, us here tonight. Matt and Sarah Hasselbeck. <laughs> Are these mics on? Oh, you guys are good. How about Juice? One more time for Juice. They were great. Okay, so this is the first time Matthew and I have ever spoken together, so give us some grace. Now we've spoken to each other. We've spoken to each other, but right. just <laughs> with like each other. And we even brought notes because yeah. just we lived a long time. We met in 93. I don't know when you guys were born, but. Okay, don't, so, don't answer that. Um, we are excited to be here, excited to be back in Boston at Boston College, back where it all began. And uh, for Matthew and I, our story, our common thread has been football. You can say that in our relationship, it's me, Matthew, and football. We dated for seven years and been married now 17 years. And in every football game, there's a game plan. And the game plan's there to help you win it's there to help you execute what you practice daily and there's a play caller who you have to wholly trust and who leads you and when we left BC and we got married there was a game plan we did not expect and a play caller that made all the difference so here we go so we met at uh, freshman orientation I don't know if you, any of you guys met at freshman orientation actually, actually I saw him and I said to I hit the girl next to me who I didn't know I said oh, who is that and she said that's Matt Hasselbeck he's so cocky but it's probably true I was cocky, but that girl that she was sitting next to was my high school girlfriend. Who well, BC Housing put me across the hall from, and then we lived together for three years. Gonzaga, third floor, yes. Yes. freshman year, and then roommates, and yeah. So, but it's not surprising that um, uh, I was cocky, maybe, because my hair was so beautiful sweet beautiful blonde hair. Like, you, you guys, I can't even tell you how legit my hair was. So, some of you guys that are feeling good about your hair, just careful, careful, <laughs> careful. But uh, I remember in, in high school, I think I was a little arrogant because I was, you know, I was being recruited to play football, and it was like I was getting scholarship offers to play football around the country and I said to uh, my dad I'm like hey dad you know I'm sure you guys like have a little bit of money you were gonna help me with college but now I'm getting a scholarship you know what do you think like I don't have a car I've never had a car why don't you pay you know chip in get me a car man I need some wheels you know and um, He's like, tell you what, get on a roll, second semester, senior year of high school, and you know, start reading your Bible more, maybe talk to your friends about your, the Bible, and, and cut your hair, those three things, and you know, we'll talk about a car. I'm like, no problem, dude, no problem. So end of the deal, I'm like, okay, bam, here are my grades, on a roll. Uh, he's like, wow, on a roll, that's impressive, and I, I have noticed you've been uh, reading your Bible more and even talking to your friends about the Bible, it's great, um, but what's up with the hair? You didn't cut your hair. And I was like, well, Dad, you know, I was reading my Bible, and uh, pretty sure Jesus and his friends, they all had long hair, so. And he was like, yeah, well, I'm pretty sure Jesus and his friends walked everywhere they went to, so. No, God. <laughs> It's not a true story, it's not a true, but I did have, did have sweet hair back then. Okay, so here at BC, we lived basically on our foundations from our parents, and we had great parents. And we lived on our foundations of our friends and what we thought was right. 
and we both grew up in like great households. Our parents were awesome. We were raised in the church. We did the things that probably a lot of you guys did, First Communion, Confirmation, all those things. Um, it wasn't until like, I guess maybe that we're grown up that we really see the, the fruits of those seeds that were planted so long ago from our parents. And then, and then again, look back at what happened here at Boston College in that, in that same way. So a seed that was planted here for me, um, specifically was uh, the strength coach started hosting a FCA group for student athletes on Wednesday nights in the weight room. So the, when I'm so old that Tom Coughlin was the head coach of the football team when I was recruited here and his strength coach came in from Kansas State I think it was and he wanted to do this thing and there were some girls from the field hockey team there's some girls some guys from the football team and and it was like sure I'll go and and it was it was really so nice. So we went and we went. one night there was this group of guys from Harvard who played soccer and really handsome and talented and you knew they were going places and one of them started to share about um, how he felt about Jesus dying for him and his sins and he was tearing up and I just couldn't understand where that emotion was coming from I just had never considered that kind of feeling being evoked because of the gospel. And I knew, I knew that made a huge impact on you. And I think for us, like in the college experience, it was like some moments of, wow, this is really amazing. I'm growing, I'm learning. And then there were other moments where it's like, hey, it's college and I'm cruising. I'm just kind of going with the flow. In fact, I remember those meetings over there in Conti Forum's weight room. Um, <laughs> after a while, you know, there was 20 of us, and there was 15 of us, and then you guys even bailed. It was like me and the strength coach after a while. And I just went because, I don't know, I was afraid of him and I was afraid of Coach Coughlin. But there were numerous times where it was him and it was me sharing like a dumbbell bench, bench, like straddling it. Like I'm sitting on this side like a seesaw. He's that side and we're going through his like little lesson plan on like why I shouldn't gripe about my coach or, you know, whatever it might be. And that guy actually is still working as a strength coach for the New York Giants. And in my 18 year career in the NFL, I would see this guy before every game or after every time we played the Giants. And he'd be like, hey, I remember when it was you and me in that weight room at Boston College. Do you remember that? I'm like, how could I, how could I forever forget it? I was so embarrassed. It was ironic that I was embarrassed that I was there. Right. But, uh, but again, there was something inside of me that felt like, no, this, this is the right thing that I should be doing. And it did absolutely pay dividends for me. And you had one other major. Yeah, and I, I think another, another example, I was an orientation leader. I don't know if anybody here was an orientation leader ever, but uh, I was an orientation leader and a, a Jesuit at the time came to me and said, hey, why don't you apply to one of our service programs? I don't know what they're called now. It's probably something different. It was called the Ignacio Volunteers at the time. And they had trips to Appalachia or Belize or Jamaica, all these different places. And I wish I could tell you that I like, was really like, oh, I should, I should do something bigger than myself. Truly, what happened was this guy invited me and I didn't have a great excuse, like ready. And so I applied to this program and before you know it, a year later, I'm going um, to the slums of Kingston, Jamaica with 22 other students I had never met, probably never would have met had I not gone. And a lot of different things happened on that trip, some good, some bad, but I remember one time in particular, I was one of the last guys coming in from the work that we were doing, and we were at a home for victims of leprosy, and there was only one seat left, and it was next to this leper. This guy's name was George McPhee, and he had no fingers, no hands, no nose, no eyes, nothing. It's hard to look at. I'm embarrassed to say it, but I didn't want to sit next to him. And we we're singing hymns, and he's playing the harmonica somehow, and in between each song, he's saying, thank you, Jesus, thank you for blessing me, thank you for blessing my life and I'm like losing my mind here I am a quarterback at Boston College with aspirations of playing quarterback at the next level and you would think that my role models at the time would be Brett Favre Joe Montana Troy Aikman and I'm sitting next to this leper in Kingston Jamaica like I wish I had what this guy had like that's I want more of that and um, it was profound. So I come back with like, this whole new outlook and really like, I'm gonna be different, things are gonna be different. And, uh, and a lot of these stories I'm not proud of. So here's another one I'm not proud of. So I come back and uh, I was a marketing major and I had a marketing exam and I'm sitting in the classroom and I'm like, oh man, you guys ready for this test? And I said to some of my buddies that I didn't think probably studied as hard as I studied. I'm like, you guys ready for this uh, test on uh, chapter eight? And they're like, chapter seven. I'm like, chapter eight. I'm like, I just wouldn't get this wrong. It's chapter eight. I'm like, Dude, it's chapter seven. And I'm like, I asked this girl in front of me. I'm like, hey, what, what, uh, what's this test on? She's like, chapter seven. I 
was like, oh no. So th these guys are like, hey, this is what you do, okay? They're from Boston, okay? So this makes sense, okay? Hey, hey, just go act like you're wicked sick, okay? Go to the infirmary or whatever, go see the doctor. So I did this, this is awful that I did this. I went to the doctor, okay? And I said, oh, I have an ear infection. And this dude looks, this old, old man, doctor, he looks in my ear and he's just like, uh, you don't have an ear infection, but something's wrong, something's not right. And I'm like, uh, I'm faking, I'm like, this is not even real, I'm faking this. <laughs> He, he admits me to the infirmary on Newton campus. And any of you that lived on Upper know you never want to go to Newton campus, right? <laughs> kidding, kidding. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm there in the infirmary, and the next thing I remember, I don't even remember what happened or how this happened, I wake up, I've got this big bruise on my chin and like a, a, a mark on my head, and I'm wedged between the toilet and the wall, and uh, I don't even know what happened. I had contracted hepatitis A in Jamaica, and it's like a 40-day incubation period, and I had no idea that I even had it. So this is my chance to be the starting quarterback, and I end up spending a week at St. Elizabeth's down the street, um, all the while missing that. And it, truly and honestly, though, wouldn't, wouldn't have changed anything uh, in that experience just because of the experience that I had with George McPhee. Right, and so we have a long life, so we need to get moving. Okay, so sorry. now you're drafted by the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> so he gets drafted by the Green Bay Packers, and we are so excited. And surprised. I mean, I had a pro day here over at Alumni Stadium, and we didn't have a bubble in the winter, so, uh, or the, so I had a pro day, and only one team showed up. It was the quarterback's coach for the Green Bay Packers, Andy Reid, so some of you guys may know. And it was snowing so bad, he's like, hey, you want to go outside and throw? And I said, yes. He goes, okay, well, we're not going to go outside and throw. That was a test, and you passed. Maybe you could play in Green Bay. And that was it. So we never even threw. So I'm like, all right, well, this isn't going to work. Right, and his dad didn't think it was going to work either. He took me into his um, bedroom where he grew up, and, and Matthew had every Sports Illustrated cover plastering the war wall. And he said, Sarah, he's competing against this guy, Brett Favre, David Klinger, and Rick Meyer. Rick Meyer. He's like, he is not making this team. He's not making this team. And, and actually, and he made the team. Well, I, technically, I didn't make the team. I made the practice team, like, right. made the practice squad. And so I was the fourth string quarterback. So there's really nothing for a fourth string quarterback to do in an NFL practice. So they said, hey, you need to play tight end, OK? You need to play tight end, like scout team tight end, practice team tight end. Well, I hadn't played tight end since I was 12, OK? So anyway, I go up against this guy named Reggie White every day in practice. <laughs> like, this is not real. But, but hey, whatever. It's a job, and it, it sure beats a lot of other jobs. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it. Well. One of the things I really struggled with at Boston College in terms of like being a, a follower of Christ was how do, you, how do I do that and yet still be this like tough football player that I wanted to be on the football field? Like I really never saw that modeled in my locker room and I certainly wasn't modeling it myself. And Reggie White was one of the first guys and there were many in that locker room that like quite honestly, like he would just kick your ass on the football field and help you out and kick your ass again and help you out. And he'd be offended that I just swore even. But like he was a very devout guy and he, he was the best in the world at what he did. And he was very physical and it was just like a punisher. I forget he had a nickname, I don't forget what it was, but like he never raised his voice, he had respect in the locker room. And I was like, okay, that that is that's it. Like I saw it modeled from him and other guys. Right. And there are a lot of couples there who are actually living out God's principles in their married lives and in their single lives and we caught notice of that and we knew there was something different about them. One of the quarterbacks with him, um, Danny Werfel. Danny Werfel so Danny was, we were teammates my third year. Danny Werfel was kind of like Tim Tebow before there was a Tim Tebow. He was the quarterback in Florida. He was a Heisman Trophy candidate, or Heisman Trophy winner, probably should have won two. Uh, when I was in college, I was a quarterback at Boston College. If I had seen Danny Werfel, quarterback in Florida, on the street, no doubt I would have asked for his autograph. Like, I love this guy. And now all of a sudden, we're teammates. And we're actually neighbors. And um, we are married, no kids. I think maybe they were married, no kids. And we just spent so much time with them. But what, he, what Danny really challenged me personally on was knowing why I believed what I believed. Like, I was pretty good at reciting facts about Jesus of Nazareth and who crucified him and what happened three days later and all that kind of stuff. But I didn't really know, like, I'd really never investigated it myself. So I don't know that I really 
I don't know, it was something that was an area of growth that I hadn't made that I knew I needed to make. And I know that was the book he gave you. And he, he gave me a book uh, entitled More Than a Carpenter. It was a short paperback, which is what I liked at the time. And uh, it was written by this guy, Josh McDowell, who set out to disprove the claims of Jesus and his followers, his disciples. And uh, at the end of like 14 years or something like that, he wrote a short book and he's like, you know, I can't prove it, but I'm pretty sure this guy Jesus is who he said he was. And that was powerful to me. And, um, and it, it was his wife that just touched me. I had never met someone so selfless and generous. And she had this, um, they talk about in the New Testament, like this aroma of Christ. And it was so powerful that I, 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 knew, I knew I wanted I wanted what she had. I didn't really know exactly, but I, I wanted what she had. And so now we're great. Things are great in Green Bay. We are around strong people, and, and traded. And then we get traded, and we end up in Seattle, farther from home than we've ever been. No friends, no family. Pregnant, and then we have one baby, and then we have three babies, and football is more pressure and more intense than it's ever been. And pregnant for like five years straight, I, I would add. It was like baby, couple months, baby, couple baby. <laughs> okay. It was just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we get there that first year, and uh, I don't know, like, it's, 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 it's hard being a parent, I guess is my point, okay? Like, babies cry, there's no manual. I remember we were at the hospital, and there was like two days, we were there two days maybe, and uh, they were like, all right, you guys can go home. We were like, no, we can't. You can't trust us. We don't know what to do. Like, we don't, and um, luckily, again, there were people placed in our lives that were uh, amazing people that we learned from, mostly older than us, some younger than us, but, um, but it was a tough time, I think, being, in Seattle and I came in with a little bit of this like a little bit of a cocky arrogant kid from Boston that you know played in Green Bay and had a blast and had fun and um, backed up Brett Favre and just thought I could just do things like Brett and without paying my dues and without being anywhere near as talented and so there was a moment I remember I was the starting quarterback supposedly like the leader of the team I built my faces on all the buildings there in Seattle and I was a little bit of a punk and uh, um, I got into a, like an argument with my coach, my head coach, who was credentialed. He had coached Joe Montana and Brett Favre, and he was a Hall of Fame type coach. And uh, you know, he had said something to me, and he actually was wrong, but it was an honest mistake. And I had said something kind of flippant back. And a rookie on the team came up to me, a rookie running back, and he's like, "Hey, uh, I know I'm a rookie, and I know you're the quarterback, and you're a veteran, but uh, I know you also, you know, profess to be, you know." follower of Jesus Christ like you say you're a Christian and your behavior towards the coach last week was really disrespectful I know I'm a rookie and it's not my place to say it but I think you owe him an apology and I was like oh thanks dude but like he forgot he didn't even notice like I don't owe him an apology so I come home and I say just tell Sarah the story and what does she say you need to go you need to apologize, to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, she was wrong, but uh, I'm a good husband, and uh, so I go and apologize. And it's like three weeks now. There's no way this guy's even going to remember, so that's why it was even more awkward to apologize. So I go into Mike Holmgren's office, and I go to apologize. I'm like, Coach, you probably don't even remember this. Like three weeks ago, it was a walkthrough practice. You said something to me. I was kind of a smart aleck back. He's like, oh, no, I remember. <laughs> and it was the greatest, it was really one of the greatest moments that he and I had ever had together, because I took the advice from a rookie and from my wife to apologize and get to know this guy. And really, as a quarterback, your job is to obviously know the game plan, know the playbook, but to know, kind of know what the play caller is looking for. And I remember, like, I was struggling as, as a quarterback early in Seattle, and he'd call a play into the huddle. He'd be like, all right, we're going to go green, right, Z, short, 93, blast, alert, kill to pass 312, double quick catch, get the first down. And like, that's like a, it's actually like a real basic play, either run it to the left or just a short throw. And I would just do like the, the rule says this, like it's like, uh, well there's seven. seven in the box, six in the box, I'm gonna throw the ball. Well if something went bad, he would lose his lid on me. And I'd be like, what's, his, what's the problem? Like I just did what I was supposed to do. Well when I got to really know him, get to know the play caller, I'd learned that when he said get the first down, he meant run the ball. But I didn't really know him. Like, I didn't know what he really wanted, and that was really my job. And so, like, when I figured out what he was looking for, 
it allowed me to be a much better quarterback. Our offense took off, flourished. We were great in the red zone, great on third round. We were tops in a lot of categories. And I think at the same exact time, like football was taken off and I figured it out, like how to trust this guy and just do what he said and follow his lead. Like spiritually, I think we were really growing in that regard as well. Right. And with the quarterback room we had, like when we got there, it was Jim Zorn, Trent Dilfer, Brock Heward, who were like really three of the most solid guys I've ever met in their faith, more mature than we were. We were growing. And their wives, and I got to be around their wives. And, and their, yeah, and their wives were, maybe even stronger than the guys in right. terms of maturity. And, and it was during this time there were lots of trials. There were lots of great times and there were lots of tough times. And one time, that I, a small trial, that I got to put what I had been learning. Can, can I just add yeah. one thing? This, <laughs> well, I know this story, but I just wanted to, someone said this to me once when I was in Seattle, and it really changed really changed a lot in my faith. But uh, it, was, uh, it was a visiting person, he said, he said, imagine if you studied the life of Martin Luther King Jr., your, all four years that you went to college, and you knew everything he ever said, every, ever wrote, or what people said about him that knew him or that were around him. And then all of a sudden, someone comes and says to you, oh, uh, MLK Jr., he said, uh, you know, if someone does that, you should punch him. Like, that, I don't know if he said that or if he ever said that, but like, it doesn't feel right. That feels counterfeit. Like, that feels like, I know, I, I don't know this man, but like, I feel like I know this man because I've really invested in learning about who he was, what his character was. And in the same way, I think that's what I was challenged to learn about Jesus. Is he who he said he was? What did he say when he was here? What did people that knew him say about him, friends and enemies? And then you at least know his character better. And I think that was a real, that changed, that, that helped me. It was a word picture for me that, that made a lot of sense. Right, and it's exactly that. It's Jesus' character that we were trying to be more like. And there was a game where we had to win to make it to the playoffs. And Matthew was slightly injured. I think he had a broken wrist and something in his butt. So the, um, <laughs> it was it was a it was a pulled muscle in my hip. Right. <laughs> here and the, Let's just stay with the broken new, wrist. Was that was injured coach, enough. Okay. New head coach Pete Carroll and he decided to go with um, the backup Charlie Whitehurst. And I had a really bad attitude about this. I'm a very I'm an overly competitive person, um, and it's so true. I didn't it's have true. a good attitude. But my kids had a great attitude. They were psyched for this game. Go Seahawks, go Charlie, go! Go Charlie, go! And I knew I had to be all in like them because they were watching me and how I was acting. And the other player families were watching me and how they were acting. And I knew God was watching me and how I was acting and how I would go through this small trial in a God-honoring way. You know, in the New Testament, James says, consider it pure joy when facing a trial. And these things would come back to me. These were things that I was all learning and hearing from the other wives and different um, books I was reading and the Bible, and it was time to put it into practice. So I knew I had to be all in, even if my heart wasn't there, because I knew God was good, I knew his character, I knew he would be with us, even when my fear of what might happen if it didn't go our way. And it's a better way to live. And Charlie played great, and the team won, and we made the playoffs. And uh, we were the first uh, team with a losing record to go to the playoffs. We were 7-9 and nine that year and got to host the world champion um, New Orleans Saints. So game starts out. I'm the starter. People are like, I don't know if this is the right idea. First pass. Doesn't go very well. He throws an interception. It was tipped at the line of scrimmage, OK? It's terrible. OK, so start with an interception. <laughs> But then, you know, followed by four touchdown passes, we're, we're beating the Saints, uh, Drew Brees and the world champs. This is the beast mode game, Marshawn Lynch. Uh, seismic activity creates an earthquake in Seattle. It was really epic. And the funny thing about this game, and my son probably was four, and we didn't know if he could talk at that time. And I know, remember during the game, I don't remember where he was, which shows what a good parent I was, but I think he was sliding up and down those you know, silver rails during the game. And, then, and near the end of the game, he comes back and goes, Mommy, it's a comeback. And I'm like, you can talk. <laughs> it's amazing. 
So everything went well. I mean, really, I, I, I think, but then all, you know, we thought what we were holding on to was like not being basically kicked out of Seattle. And sure enough, we lose the next round in the playoffs to the Chicago Bears, and uh, we have the NFL lockout. And maybe in part because of the lockout, I get a call when the lockout ends, um, and Pete Carroll says, hey, uh, we had this lockout. This seems like as good a time as any to break up and you know part ways you know we want to get younger and and we're out of Seattle and that was tough it was terrible and I, and I think like one of our main things that we've learned in our lives is that we would love to plan things out perfectly like I would have loved to had a Heisman Trophy type career at Boston College I would have loved to been Eagle of the Year like you or in the BC Hall of Fame like you but none of those things happened okay right. but <laughs> but God <laughs> But God's plan was so much better than my plan ever could have been. I mean, when I went to that first mini camp with the Green Bay Packers, I was hoping to get, like, get they let me keep my Green Bay Packers shorts, you know? Otherwise, I was going to have to like steal them and hope they didn't payroll deduct me. But like, it was so much better than that. Right, and I so think we're leaving Seattle where we had planned to spend the rest of our lives. And we're headed to Nashville, Tennessee. And Nashville, Tennessee couldn't have been a more amazing place, and we were, treasured the two years we got to live there. And, and just quickly, I mean, I ended up having the best year of my career that first year in Nashville, but it wasn't so much about football there in Nashville. No. I feel like it was more about the relationships that we were fortunate enough to make there. And when we moved there, like, God was with us there, and that was so tangible to me, and he had gone before us. When I showed up, there was a woman, a gracious woman, who opened up her contact book, and I hit the ground running with three kids like I had lived there for 10 years. And Nashville is known as the country music, home of country music, which is awesome. But Nashville is also the home of Christian music. And Christian music is where I learned scripture. It's where I got to memorize it to my heart. And without even knowing without it. Without even knowing it. And there's a song that touched us both when we were in Nashville, and it was about how when God breaks your, when your heart breaks for what breaks God's heart. And we would think about what, what are those things that would break God's heart? Well, it would be orphans, widows, the least of these, like those who can't speak up for themselves, like the types of people that I had met in Jamaica, the types of people here you see in your communities here. And now things weren't just always about football here in Nashville, and our time and our treasure now had more of a purpose. And ironically, I was assigned by the Tennessee Titans because I was an old, old guy. I was an old quarterback. I was 35 or 36 years old, and we had two young quarterbacks. And the young quarterbacks, I mean, it was a two-way street. Like, I was supposedly mentoring them, but they were, they were pouring into me, and we were all growing together. And I remember a time, like, we, I had actually invited these guys to uh, kind of like a team chapel situation. My dad played in the NFL, so I was real comfortable in kind of like a team chaplain environment very similar to like being in the military I guess and uh, we were we were at a at like a conference type thing and these guys decided with their wives to sort of get serious about their faith and uh, they said hey uh, can, can we talk to you he said um, our team chaplain's not here, and we would like to kind of take this next step in our relationship, and we'd like to get baptized. Like, would you mind being part of that baptism? And I'm looking at him like, am I even qualified to do that? Like, I don't even know. Like, <laughs> this is great. But these relationships were formed. And looking back now, we see all the stuff that we've all been through that were there in that Nashville, Tennessee team. We had a teammate die. Uh, in a car accident way too soon, a young guy. One of those quarterbacks' mother-in-law died of ALS abruptly, friend of ours. We have a, another teammate that was a captain. I was the offensive captain, special teams captain. I just wrote the foreword for his book about his fight with ALS right now. His name's Tim Shaw. And like just, I can't, I don't think we could ever imagine not being there and having built those relationships. Again, our plan would have never included Nashville, would have never known these people, and God's plan was so much better, so much stronger. Yeah, we had made roots. Um, our kids were so happy, they were thriving. And then all of a sudden, we're off to Indianapolis. Right, and, and before we left uh, Nashville, I think part of the reason we were so, it was hard to leave is we were plugged into a lot of the charities that we were, I mean, it really became our passion, whether it was um, Charity Water, or Danita's Children, or 147 Million Orphans, or mm -hmm. IJM, and- Medical you know, Teams International. Medical Teams International. We didn't want to get 
pulled from it. And uh, you know, we, we got our first dog in Nashville. We named him Titan because we were playing for the Tennessee Titans. And what do you know, immediately, I play for the Indianapolis Colts. And one of the first guys I meet is Andrew Luck. And he's like, hey, what's going on, man? What's your dog's name? I'm like, oh, it's Titan. He's like, got to change the name. It's not going to work. It's got to be Colt. I'm like, can you do that? No. I don't think you can do that. Like, he's a dog. Let me try. <laughs> Come here, Colt. Nothing. Like, so he's Titan. He's yep. still Titan. And so, and so that was a change. That, that was a change that we didn't see coming. And I don't think we really saw it coming for a long time. And in our, I don't know what year it was in India, we had an opportunity to take our family to Africa, to Malawi. And this is something that like we were good to do with ourselves, but I think we were maybe holding on tight to our kids. Like, is that really right for our kids? Is that really safe? Like, like how do you balance the, the, the trust and the good being a good parent? And we ended up taking them at a really an inor- inopportune time, mm-hmm. wouldn't you say? In- inopportune for football, it, w- it was a risk. Bad, it was, it was a risky decision with like off-season training, kids weren't even off of school, uh, I could barely keep up with the math homework at that point anyway, so if we were going to miss like a week of geometry, it was going to be like I would have to review when we came back. <laughs> but we decided to go anyway, and uh, we kind of got set up on a blind date with another family of five, we had a mutual friend, he said you guys would like them. Uh, how about you guys all meet in South Africa and then you like travel on to Malawi together. And so we told the teachers, hey, can you give us the homework for our kids um, while they're gone? And all the teachers did but one. And that one teacher said, you know, no, I don't, I don't want them to do their homework. I want your daughter, your oldest daughter, who's in fifth or sixth grade, sixth grade, I want her to make a movie, like an iMovie, of the trip. So she does. We come back from the trip. It's amazing. We learned so much. Uh, we felt even more passionate about the work that Charity Water does. That's the trip. And uh, our daughter shows this to her teacher. Teacher's moved by it, shows it to her class, shows it to another teacher. The other teacher says, well, what, how much does it cost to build a clean water well for a village of people? Like, what's it cost? Well, somewhere between $5,000, maybe fifteen, depending. That school, those teachers were so moved by this little homework assignment that they mobilized that school, that middle school, to, in three different campaigns run by the kids in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, raise over $23,000, they did it themselves, and get clean drinking water for over 1,000 people for the next 20 years in countries like Mali, Ethiopia, Uganda, and like it was moments like that, it was just like, why are we in Indy? Like, is it because of the Colts or the Titans or the Seahawks or the Packers? No, but like the, the impact and just the feeling of being a vessel for God to work through you just through obedience of, of accepting the risk of going on the trip was right. powerful. But quickly, it got all about football in that third year. So I don't know if any of you guys like Chipotle. I used to love Chipotle. I no longer love Chipotle, okay? <laughs> so. I forget what the details of the story were, but basically, I came home, got Chipotle for everybody, we're doing homework. You fell asleep upstairs doing homework with the kids. I had my burrito bowl, I had her burrito bowl. Yeah, it was the chicken bowl, that's what. Sorry, chicken, whatever. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> we're playing a game, we're playing the Jacksonville Jaguars that next, like, two days later. Well, Andrew Luck had, like, lacerated his kidney or something against the Broncos and couldn't play totally soft, okay? <laughs> I'm kidding. He always plays. I really hadn't played ever it was in, my, in right. my three years there. So now all of a sudden I'm starting against the Jacksonville Jaguars and I'm fine, healthy, no problem. Well, I, there was like a bacterial infection that's found in chicken, I can't even pronounce it, that Chipotle had like sabotaged like a ton of people at this Chipotle in Indianapolis. It's happened all across the world, look it up, okay? <laughs> so I get hit with it, I start getting hit with it in like the third or fourth quarter of this game against Jacksonville. I get like this crazy headache. I'm dizzy. I'm thinking I have a concussion. I I I didn't think I even got hit in the head. Um, I start vomiting on the sidelines. I'm puking my brains out. We're in overtime. It's a two-minute drill. I'm shivering. I got a headache. I'm throwing up. I go up to like one of the trainers or the doctors. I'm like, doc, I tell him my symptoms. He's like, it's overtime. It's two-minute offense. It's just nerves. I'm like, bro, it's my 18th year, okay? I'm not nervous about a two-minute drive against Jacksonville, okay? I'm not nerves. I was angry, very angry. 
Yeah. So we win the game, and uh, like, again, I'm throwing up worse after the game. Like, uh, you guys were out of town, mm -hmm. and our, our daughters play lacrosse. They were out of town, so they weren't even there for it. I called and said, hey, do you guys want to come to this game? I think I'm going to start. My middle daughter was like, mm, who's it against? And uh, I was like, oh, we're playing Jacksonville. She's like, nah, no thanks. I mean, they're spoiled, OK? So, so I'm trying to drive home. I can't even drive home. Like, I'm that sick. I don't even make it home. I stop at Andrew Luck's house. His mom's taking care of me. I, I <laughs> pile on, try to get home. Long story short, I end up in the hospital again. We play on Thursday night of that week. It's hard, healthy, to play Sunday and then try, try to go play on Thursday. Now I'm in the hospital. I get admitted to the hospital. They put a pick line in. Uh, the, the, the nurses, they don't know what I do for a living. I don't know why I look like an NFL football player. I don't know why they didn't know. And they're like, oh, sir, you're probably not going to be able to go to uh, to work for a couple, for maybe like a month, month and a half. I'm like, ah, I got J.J. Watt and the Texans on Thursday, you know, but I was very sick. So I would say this, like, this is probably the weakest I've ever felt in my life, going back to hepatitis or anything. Deathly ill, felt like the team needed me. Remember, I had a conversation with you in the garage before we left for the game on Wednesday. Right, you almost, they were going to, they were going to pull the plug on you and they weren't going to let you play. And you kind of got a little bit of a boost. Um, at exact, during that same week, a teammate of my daughter's mother was dying. And, a, a and we didn't, so it was a, a basketball teammate of my, of my middle school daughter. Didn't even know she was sick. I get a text as I'm getting an IV one day and says, hey, um, they're, bringing, they're bringing hospice in for Michelle. And I'm like, what? Like, what? Are we, what? And I just remember in that moment, I was ready to quit. And I thought, this is an illness that, I likely will recover from. Like I can't even imagine the strength of this woman. And I just got like this little boost and So he decides to play and he's leaving for, it's probably Wednesday morning, he's leaving for the Thursday night game and we were it was early in the morning, it was dark outside, everyone was asleep, but I followed Matthew into the garage, he was getting his car, and we just had this moment that was like, if this goes down, this is because of God. And we just said it verbally to each other. This is God right now. I remember being at um, at like the pregame meal. Call it a meal. I mean, I was shivering. I was on an IV table with blankets over me. Andrew Lux quizzing me, and uh, I, I, I seriously like I couldn't even walk. I don't know how I'm going to play in this game, and. Um, the team chaplain came over and he said, you know, in uh, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, um, Paul talks about, in my weakness, he like prayed for God to heal him of something. And he said, but if you're not willing for your purpose to, you don't want to heal me, then in your weakness, in my weakness, let your strength be perfect. And, and I didn't know if I could do it, but I did know this through knowing the Word of God, knowing the story of the Bible, that almost every time God does something amazing, He does it through the least likely person or the, someone who was seen as weak in the context of where that person was living, where there was King David, the youngest son of a, of a of older brothers that would have been more likely, or Moses, someone who probably had a stuttering problem, who... Or Rahab, <laughs> the prostitute Rahab, or Mary Magdalene, who was a woman and got to see the empty tomb, and Esther, who got to save her people. And so I did know that if something miraculous were to happen, I know I couldn't do it, but he had the power to do it. and so. Long story short, not that God cares about wins or losses or anything like that, but we go out and I knew I did not think I could finish this game. J.J. Watt did not touch me one time. I played lights out, don't even hardly remember the game. Um, and the amazing thing for me is that I know it, it was not me. I mean, I did my part, but like, it was not me. And to have, to know that God's power works through you at times. It's like this little God wink that I can't know for sure because it's faith, but I, I promise you, like, it is a powerful, powerful moment. And I, we actually ended that game with a long bomb to T.Y. Hilton, and, um, and we, got to, we got to kneel on the ball to end the game, the play after that. And the referees, they write a little number on the ball. Um, like it's like a notification. I don't know if it's their jersey number, or they number the balls or whatever. But I kept that ball and brought it back to the family um, 
whose the mother ended up passing away, and I gave it to the little girl. And that little girl's jersey number on our basketball team, this football had the number two on it. And for some unknown reason, I've never seen a ball marked this way, but just right under that logo, it was like just the number two. And it was just like this powerful moment. So as I'm getting interviewed um, right after the game by the sideline reporter, and she's asking me about the game, asking about like X's and O's, I kind of see the ball and I see it, and I just lose it. Like I've never really lost it like that on a football field. But uh, So here we are back in Boston, and we hope that we continue to grow in our relationship so we can have those moments again, that we can be used and available to God in this next season, which we have no idea. <laughs> but we don't know what the game plan is, but we know who our caller is, and uh, that's where we're at. Thank you.